Well, for more on shadow banking and when, whether it's good or harmful for the global economy, I'm joined by Robert Hockett. He's a pro law professor from Cornell University. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me on. So we've had a look at how damaging shadow banking can potentially be to an economy. What are some of the pros and cons? Well, I mean, the, the key to shadow banking, I think, is to focus first on the banking part and then on the shadow part, right? The banking part, the reason people call shadow banks shadow banks is because of one particular uh, feature uh, of the balance sheets of the shadow bank, which essentially replicates that feature uh, uh, that you find in a regular bank's balance sheet. So the key characteristic is that they borrow very short term and then they lend longer term. Uh, this is what's called maturity transformation, right? Because uh, essentially the, the, the obligations that the shadow bank incurs mature much more quickly than do the assets that they purchase with that borrowed money. Now, ordinarily, this can be a very good thing because it essentially enables a lot more lending to be done, so it increases the amount of credit in the economy. The danger, however, comes with the possibility uh, of a run, right? Run risk is that which uh, tends to afflict anything that engages, any entity that engages in banking in that sense. Because if suddenly the short-term loans that you've taken out come due, if the people who have lent to you are not willing to roll over the loans or, or you can't find replacement loans for them, you might suddenly be uh, unable to pay your various obligations out to those folk um, because you can't quickly liquidate the assets that you've purchased with the borrowed funds. So that's the risk that attaches to any kind of banking, including shadow banking. Right. Now, the problem with the shadow, right, the problem comes in with the shadow. We regulate banking very carefully, specifically because of that very risk. Shadow banks are not regulated as regular banks, and hence we don't have the usual safeguards against that run risk that all banks that engage in maturity transformation are subject to. Now, I'd like to bring in Brian Wolf, a finance professor from the School of Management from the University of Buffalo. Brian, are there ways that shadow banking can have a positive effect on the economy? Yeah, absolutely. So shadow banking is, uh, is a really large part of the U.S. economy at this stage. So if you take a look at the volume of credit intermediation that's occurred in the last year, uh, half of that's come through shadow banks, uh, the other half through the traditional banking system. I mean, even just taking a look at residential mortgages, if you, if you look at the volume of uh, FHA-type loans, so riskier loans that were originated in 2015, 70 to 80 percent of those were originated by shadow banks. Uh, Forty percent of conventional loans, uh, mortgage loans, were originated by uh, shadow banks. And, and so they're really kind of a key piece of our economy already. So, Robert, what's driving the need for these shadow banks to exist, and who are the big winners and losers? Well, there's a great need for credit in any economy, and in particular, as the economy is growing, there's a great need for, uh, for, 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 for credit. Uh, and the shadow banks essentially are, represent another form of credit, right, or another source of credit for those who need it. Um, it's probably also true to say that shadow banks in the United States are much less shadowy than they were before the crisis, right, because one of the most important features of the Dodd-Frank reforms uh, that were, of course, put on the books back in 2010 was precisely to bring uh, the shadow banks, what were then known as shadow banks, sort of into the ambit of regular regulatory authority, primarily by the Fed, which of course is one of the principal bank regulators as well. And what that means ultimately, I think, for the U.S. at least, is that what used to be called shadow banking probably shouldn't even be called shadow banking any longer. It should probably be just called alternative forms of credit intermediation. And it works pretty well, uh, as Brian suggested. Um, China, I think, however, has to be very careful because as, I, as far as I can tell, China is not yet regulating shadow banking in the way that the United States is. And in that sense, shadow banks in China really are still shadowy in a way that I don't believe hours are, uh, you know, at least in comparison to what they were back in 2008. So then, Brian, would shadow banking still exist in a healthy banking system where lenders were more willing to give loans to businesses? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think one of the key features following the financial crisis that we saw was uh, increased uh, regular scrutiny for traditional banks. So, uh, you know, regulators have forced large commercial banks to perform stress tests, uh, the increase uh, liquidity ratios and capital requirements. And, and in general, this really has kind of drawn back the traditional banking system into a, a less risky stance. And if we want to have a, a well-functioning capital market where we still fund those riskier type investments, we still need some type of intermediary to, to fill that void. And, and that's really kind of the role shadow banks play. And, uh, you know, in, in, instead of the typical regulatory arbitrage, I think that they tend to get uh, the, the impression of this is, really seems more like good policy, that, that we're attempting to, you know, pull traditional banks out and allow uh, shadow banks to step in. And Robert, what do you think about that role of having shadow banks step, step into that role? 
Uh, I think I think Brian's right. I mean, it's 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 very useful. I think to enable people with different risk appetites to engage in different kinds of lending, right? Uh, if you are able to handle a riskier uh, loan, uh, then you should go ahead and participate in the shadow banking markets, or you should act as a shadow bank. If you're not able to do that, then of course you should not. The key question, of course, always is whether there are going to be externalities, right? If it's possible that innocent third parties can be harmed by, by, by what's being done. So the settlement we appear to have arrived at here in the US is we've said, okay, the large systemically important institutions are essentially going to be actual banks rather than shadow banks. And so they're going to be regulated quite carefully. And then those institutions that don't uh, sort of pose su substantial risks to innocent third parties will be allowed to operate as sort of bank alternatives that are allowed then in turn to take on a bit more risk to engage in somewhat more speculative lending, although still under a regulatory umbrella of the kind that Dodd-Frank imposes. And so, of course, all of the principal shadow banking uh, firms that were around before 2008 are indeed regulated much more heavily now than they were before 2008. But that being said, if they're not systemically important, they're not regulated quite as carefully or as closely or as tightly or strictly uh, as proper banks are. And Brian, as you're mentioning there, um, despite the scrutiny that shadow banks saw after the global financial crisis, they do continue to grow. And the Federal Reserve has suggested that non-banks operate under similar margin requirements as banks. What's your take on that? Well, I, I think, again, the, the focus from the regulator's perspective has, has been on the traditional banks to require them to be safer. I, I think allowing the non-banks, the shadow banks, to, to be risky, I, th I think that gives them opportunity for other things, too, like innovation in the financial markets. When you look at things like fintech, uh, blockchain, uh, smart contracts, these are like innovative new technologies that are really kind of poised to disrupt the intermediation space. And so allowing uh, some of those more open uh, requirements for these non-banks, I think is critical to allow them to, the room to play there. Um, now, Brian, I'm sorry, um, yes, Robert, much has been said about how damaging the shadow banking can be. You mentioned some of these innocent parties that could potentially get hurt. But do the risks outweigh the benefits? Uh, I, I, I don't think, uh, happily, I don't think we have to choose, right? I mean, I don't think you have to choose between risks and benefits here. Uh, I think you can actually maintain or retain most of the benefits while at the same time substantially reducing the risks, right? One way to do that is to impose certain liquidity requirements on shadow banks to say, look, you have to have a liquidity buffer that enables you essentially to kind of pay uh, uh, your creditors once your loans come due in the event that there's some sort of a contraction, some sort of an event whereby those who have been lending to the shadow banks decide not to roll over the loans or decide you know, not to lend in the same degree of abundance before as they did before. Another way to operate, of course, is to impose uh, uh, leverage requirements, as you described earlier, as you mentioned earlier, essentially to impose higher capital buffers, while at the same time keeping those buffers less stringent than you do uh, in the case of, again, the larger traditional banks that are typically systemically important. So basically, there's always a kind of trade-off true, but you can minimize risks while retaining a lot of the benefits simply by imposing certain common sense regulations of the kind that we really first began to impose on ordinary banks back in the 1930s. And so, um, Brian, ideally, what would you like to see happen with how shadow banks are operated? Well, I, I would agree with Professor Hockett. I, I think the, the kind of middle road seems to be the, the wise path here. I mean, we learned during the financial crisis that you know, parts of shadow ba the shadow banking system were under-regulated. And uh, you know, as a result of uh, regulatory reforms from Dodd-Frank, you, you see some changes in that industry. For example, the, the lenders uh, that were originating loans that were lower quality loans and uh, not required to retain any of those loans on their balance sheet, uh, now we see credit retention reforms where those, those banks or those shadow banks actually hold some of those on their balance sheet and so kind of have a skin in the game. And so, you know, really kind of this middle road, I, I think, is probably the appropriate tact. All right. Well, thank you so much, gentlemen. Brian Wolf, finance professor from the School of Management at the University of Buffalo and Robert Hockett, law professor at Cornell University.